Hey there, welcome to episode 59 of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and as I'm shooting this, it is December 15th, so 2019 is coming to an end, and what better time than to go over the top 14 toys of 2014. So you might be wondering why the top 14 of 2014 at the end of 2019. Well, there's a couple reasons, really. Um, I've started to put my list together for the best 19 of 2019, and I'm excited to post that video. But I have to wait right till the end of the year because, as is the case most years, I might get something cool for Christmas that upsets the whole list. So I gotta wait till the end of the year before I post that list. Um, and also, normally, most episodes, I just talk about the new toys I've gotten in the past week or so. And I have bought myself a couple of toys uh, in the past couple of weeks, but not many, because I'm devoting more spending to Christmas shopping for others. And in the couple of weeks that lead up to Christmas, typically anything that I buy for myself, I like to kind of put it away and give it to myself for Christmas, so to speak. Because, you know, oftentimes I get some cool, you know, shirts or household items, um, but, but uh, I don't necessarily get a lot of toys as gifts. And that kind of helped recreate that childhood feeling of Christmas. If I'm going to buy myself toys on December 20th and stuff anyway, I might as well set it aside, open it Christmas morning, and it gives me that little childhood excitement of getting a new toy. So the new things I bought, I can't really show you yet because I'm not opening them. Um, so then I was thinking, well, what content could I do for this week's video? Well, um, if you've watched my past videos, um, you might have heard me talk about my blog. I've only been doing this YouTube thing uh, for a little less than a year, but I started blogging about toys in 2011. Um, and every at the end of every year, I would do a top 10 list, essentially. So uh, I started late in 2011, so 2012 was the first year that I posted my top 12 of 2012. And I did that right up until uh, last year, so the top 18 in 2018. Well, um, those are all on my blog. I haven't been posting my blog really for the last couple of years, um, and that's partly what led me to YouTube, is I just got kind of tired of writing about these things, um, and so I thought I'd try something new. So here I am YouTubing, but I liked those lists. I put a lot of uh, effort into them, and I still like to be able to showcase those toys. So I've gone back, and I did a video recapping my top 12 of 2012 and my top 13 of 2013. And I posted those a few months ago, and my intent was always to kind of do all the way up to 2018. Um, so I figured, well, good time to do my 2014 list. So this list might not feel uh, super relevant right now, but these are still some great toys. And if you don't have them in your collection, there's no reason why you can't seek them out, even though they're a few years old. Some of them might have shot up in value, but some of them might, might have gone down. It might be easier for you to get them than it was for me. Um, so it's also kind of nice revisiting these lists years after the fact to see uh, if I still feel the same. Do I still think this toy is great? Do I now think it kind of sucks? Um, would it make the list if I were to redo that list now? I don't know. So why don't we go through them and we'll start at the end with my 14th favorite toy of 2014. One thing before I get into talking about the list, I should just mention what my criteria was for this list. So the figures had to have been released in that calendar year and also I had to have acquired them. This is all about my collection after all. I'm not doing, you know, the best toys released in the toy industry in 2014, same as I won't be doing that for 2019. Because sure enough, they're making very expensive, very cool toys in Japan. These things cost hundreds of dollars. Um, and sure, if I were to make the best toys released in 2019, they'd probably all be things that I don't have. And, uh, yeah, so I'm not going to go there. There's probably other videos that you can check out that stuff. So this list is just basically my 14 favorite toys that I got in 2014 and that were released in 2014. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, um, let's jump into it. So number 14 is Bebop um, from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And this is the Funko Pop version. So here's a closer look at Bebop. Now Bebop was always my favorite character from the Ninja Turtles universe. Uh, There's just something about his, like, punk rock look that really appealed to me. And 
there was just never a, a version of him that seemed quite right. Like, I liked him in the cartoon, but I kind of wish he wasn't portrayed as such a bumbling oaf all the time. Um, and the original figure, uh, he was kind of hunched over, and it was a nice-looking figure, but it wasn't perfect. And they've done other versions later. In fact, in 2014, I also got this version of what they call the Master, sorry, what they call the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Classics line. And this look here isn't really based off anything in particular that I know of. It doesn't really match the cartoon or the comic book or anything like that. Um, and so I bought it just because I like Bebop as a character, but I think this figure is pretty ugly. Like, I know Warhogs are supposed to be kind of ugly, but this look doesn't really do it for me. Um, even though all the things you'd expect to see with Bebop are there. He's got the, the purple shades, the purple mohawk. He's got the like a little skull around his neck. He's got the turtle shell shoulder pads, the red sneakers. Like everything you want on a Bebop figure is there. And this is the more traditional like action figure that I'm into. But I just don't like how ugly and kind of misshapen he is. The thing about this Funko Pop is it does exactly what I want my Funko Pops to do. It takes an iconic character and it showcases all the features that make them iconic and it just gives you a perfect little representation of the character. Like this guy's got everything I just mentioned. The purple shades, purple mohawk, the little earring, the nose ring, the little skull necklace, the bullet like bandolier, turtle shell shoulder pads, red sneakers. Everything is there. You know at a very quick glance, you know this is Bebop. Some of the pop figures, it's a little harder to distinguish. Like if you have a Bruce Willis pop, you don't look at it and immediately recognize it as Bruce Willis. But this here, there's no mistaking it's Bebop. It captures him perfectly. And even though I'm hoping to get the new NECA Bebop figure um, very soon, I've got it on pre-order, and it might surpass this one as my favorite Bebop figure. To this day, even though I have multiple Bebop figures in my collection, I still think this is the best looking version of Bebop. And even though it was kind of hard to place Funko Pop on a list of best action figures of the year, partly because, you know, it doesn't move other than its head turning. There's no articulation. This isn't the kind of thing, even as a kid, I would have really played with, I don't think. So it's hard to say that it's one of the best figures of a particular year. And I didn't put too many pops on my list. But this one here, it's probably the favorite pop I have in my whole collection out of about 200 of them. So I think it's fair that this one made the best action figure list of that particular year. At number 13, we get Modulock from Masters of the Universe Classics. So here's a closer look at Modulock from the Masters of the Universe Classics line. So Masters of the Universe Classics, which is a toy line that began in 2008, um, gives us cool updated versions of all the classic Masters of the Universe characters from the 80s. And Modulock here, um, he gets his name because of his modular configuration. So this guy comes apart. Like you'll see here, all these joints. I could pop this back torso off. I could pop these legs off. You can actually construct him so he's two individual characters. Because um, you've got the two heads and all these extra arms and all these extra legs. Um, or you can do this. Or you can have any other kind of weird variation. If you want to put his head here on his shoulder and you want to put a leg coming out of his neck hole and stuff you can do that um but yeah this guy is based on the original 80s figure i think he's very close um as far as containing all the same pieces and everything i never had the original modulock when i was a kid which is probably why this figure is rather low on this list because it really is an awesome figure like not only is it awesome looking um it's just really fun and it's really unique. The Masters of the Universe toy line was full of unique characters, so it can be kind of hard to stand out in that uh, you know, array of interesting characters, but Modulog definitely does. And so the only reason he's not higher on my list is because I didn't have him as a kid, so I don't really have any nostalgic ties to this particular character the way I do with characters like Merman and Stratos and whatnot. So I was very happy when Mattel gave us this updated version of Modulock. I think he's super cool. Um, he's super fun to play with. But um, yeah, and that's why he makes this list. At number 12, we've got Tripwire from G.I. Joe. 
except this is the Creo brick version of the character. So here's a closer look at Tripwire. So as I mentioned, this is the Creo brick version of the character. And Creo was Hasbro's kind of own knockoff of Lego. And it is 100% compatible with Lego. Like you see here, this little base that every figure came with, it looks exactly like a Lego piece. It attaches to your Lego parts, um, you know, perfectly. So yeah, I'm not a Lego collector, but I was really into this Creo stuff for about a year, two years. It didn't last very long, but I think 2014 was the year that Hasbro launched their Creo lines of both G.I. Joe and Transformers. And the main part of the line was these little mini figures that were sold in blind bags. Um, that blind bags have become very popular in the years since, but basically you buy this little package, you didn't know what character you were going to get inside, and it was always a nice little surprise. Now, fortunately, there was always somebody online that published the little serial numbers that you could find on the UPC code that would tell you which character were which. So I would just check the little numbers and I would make sure to get a unique character each time and I didn't end up with a bunch of doubles. Anyway, so this here is Tripwire, the G.I. Joe, uh, I guess his position is mine detector. At least that's what his device is called. Um, so he uses it to search for mind. I guess maybe he's the detectorist, um, which by the way, if you've never watched the show, The Detectorists on Netflix, I highly recommend it. So I love this little figure. Now, as I said with the Funko Pop version of Bebop, it's kind of hard to name a little teeny brick figure like this as one of my top 14 action figures of the year. It kind of makes it seem like, well, there must have not been great action figures that year. But that's just not the case. The fact of the matter is these Creo figures are just super fun. Tripwire was, uh, I wouldn't say a favorite of mine, but he was a, a character I liked as a kid. Now here is the original Tripwire figure, at least half of him. Unfortunately, like a lot of my vintage G.I. Joes, the little washer that holds them together has rotted away. Um, so yeah, now he's in two pieces. But anyway, here's the top half of Tripwire. And you can see here he's got his little mine detector. And in his backpack, he, you can store these little mines that come out. And yeah, he was just a cool little character. And he came out in 1983. And it was the first year that really showed some diversity in the G.I. Joe brand because in the first year, 1982, most of the characters looked um, pretty much the same. They were all wearing the same outfits and stuff. So the following year, they really started to diversify with looks and with their military specialties. So the Tripwire was pretty unique. Now here you see the modern era Tripwire figure. This guy came out around 2007 or 2008. Design is very similar. Uh, his head's got a little bit more, it's a little more... Uh, I don't know, stylized or something now. So yeah, I really liked this update too. But the thing is, on the packaging for Tripwire, even way back in 1983, you could see his eyes through his visor. He seemed to have a little bit more personality, especially his file card described him as kind of a goofy guy. Um, and you just don't get that with either the original figure or the modern update. I really liked that when they made this version of Tripwire, you could finally see his eyes through the visor, which is how he always looked in the packaging artwork. And I could have picked almost any Creo character. I preferred the G.I. Joe guys over the Transformers, partly because the Transformers, you know, they, they were little Lego men like this, and you could actually take them apart and make them into their alternate vehicle modes, which was a neat thing to try, but it was didn't really work out so well. The G.I. Joes, on the other hand, they were the little figures like this, and then they came with all the kinds of vehicles. So I have the Jeeps and the Jets and the helicopters. And it was like being a kid again, because for a very affordable price, you could get a bunch of new figures and a bunch of vehicles. It was fun to build them. When I was collecting Creos in 2014, it was probably the most fun I'd had buying toys in a long, long time. Um, these things are just adorable. Um, they look the way they're supposed to look. They're not like so cute the way, like say a Funko Pop might be. Like, this guy still looks like he's kind of angry and stuff. Like, they actually make for really cool figures. And even though I could have picked any G.I. Joe because they were all pretty great, I went with Tripwire partly because he was a character that I thought never quite got his due in the standard action figure. I really like how they captured the original look. You know, everything from the little red emblem on his sleeve is there, the padded chest, the goggles, and his unique accessory, which unfortunately has snapped You'll see here this rubber wire originally connected to his backpack, but that has rotted with time. 
But yeah, Tripwire is just a really cool little figure. I like him a lot. And would he still make this list if I were to do it today? Yeah, I think so. I probably could have done a whole list on my favorite Creos, and that would have been really tough to rank them because they are just super cool. At number 11, we've got G.I. Joe's Heat Viper from the 50th anniversary collection. So here's a closer look at the Heat Viper. Now, the original Heat Viper was one of the last G.I. Joe figures I got as a kid because the last year that I ever bought a G.I. Joe figure um, was 1990, and Heat Viper came out in 1989. And here is my original Heat Viper figure from back in the day. Now, I couldn't tell you what it is about this guy that I love so much, but I just did. He had such a weird look about him. For one thing, the colors, like he's kind of this garish yellow and purple. He's got all these missiles strapped around his, his ankles, which doesn't seem like a good idea. He's got this big crazy bazooka cannon with this pipe that attaches to the side of his head, which I don't really know why. Um, this backpack with this crazy like, exhaust uh, pipes or something that I always had shooting out over his shoulder. And the mask. He's got one side completely covered in armor that I guess he can't see out of. And I assumed that was to protect him from the blast of his giant gun. And then the other head, the other half of his head is just this solid gray visor with just a little bit of his chin poking out of the bottom. It was such a, a weird, I don't know, alien, robotic, bug-like look. I just loved it. So I loved the hell out of this character. And I was really hoping that we would get a modern update of him in the modern era that kicked off in 2007. And I really didn't think we were going to get one because the line was winding down. Um, by 2014, they weren't making very many figures anymore. Um, but then we got this figure here as part of the 50th anniversary wave. Um, there weren't too many figures in that wave at all produced by Hasbro. But yeah, somehow one of my classic kind of obscure favorites made it into the line. Now, this guy here is a little different. You'll see he's still got the missiles around his ankles, but rather than be attached on individual pegs like those ones were now they're just kind of these weird anklets um, another thing that's kind of odd so he still has this big bazooka and he's got that uh, pipe on the side the tubing but he doesn't have a little uh, knob on the side of his head for it to attach to so I, it just kind of dangles there which is kind of weird um, the other thing that's kind of strange is instead of having the solid solid uh, yellow armor now he's got this silver faceplate which I guess maybe now he can see out of that side of his helmet but it's kind of odd looking because then he still has the silver on this side so it looks almost even weirder now than it did before like why not just make the whole helmet out of this or the whole helmet out of this to have it split this way just seems kind of bizarre another thing I don't love on this figure is that we no longer have any of his chin showing but we have his whole neck exposed which I don't really like I don't know why. It just I'd rather he had the full full neck covered like the original figure. And also he's just you see a lot more of the yellow. Like you see here these straps over his shoulder, which I guess were meant to hold on his uh, backpack, leave only just these little strips of yellow. Whereas here the straps are so thin, it's there's a lot more yellow jumpsuit showing. Um, he still has the same backpack. And I think it was from maybe the package art on this version that I realized the exhaust is maybe supposed to go at the bottom rather than over his shoulder. So there you go. With all the flaws I just pointed out on this figure, why did it make my year-end list? Well, to be honest, I still think it's cool, and I just loved this figure so goddamn much that I was just happy to get a new version of him. And I still think this one works. It's All the things I liked about that one, the weirdness of it, definitely still applies to this guy here. He's definitely weird. He's definitely bright. Um, he's still got all of his crazy accessories. Um, yeah, I just think he's really cool. Um, most of the things I pointed out, like the change in the missiles and the more yellow showing on his chest, none of that stuff bothers me. I don't even care that this pipe just kind of dangles. Um, the only thing I would definitely like to see changed is the exposed neck. But uh, that's hardly going to make me not love this figure. Um, I actually like this guy so much. I bought a couple of them, and I really stopped doing that um, by this point in time in my collecting, because I used to buy little squads of Cobra Troopers, 
But I just ended up with so many figures, I said, nope, just one of each. But when it came to the Heat Viper, I had to buy two, just on the off chance one of them were to break or something. I wanted to have one in mint condition at all times because I just love them so much. So yeah, this guy would definitely still make my list. I think he's great. At number 10, Agent Venom from Marvel Legends. So here's a closer look at Agent Venom. Now, unless you're a hardcore Venom fan, you might be a little confused by what exactly this is. Um, because most people know Venom to look like this. This is kind of the standard Spider-Man villain. That's what he looks like most of the time. That's what he looked like in the movie. Um, and this is Eddie Brock. This is what Venom looks like when the symbiote is attached to Eddie Brock. But there was a time in the comic books when Eddie was separated from the symbiote and Spider-Man's old high school uh, rival Flash Thompson, who was a military vet at this time, took over the role of Venom. Um, the military had captured the Venom symbiote and basically found a way to control it, and they wanted to pair it with a soldier. Flash was a good candidate because he had actually lost his legs in combat from the knee down, and by merging with the symbiote, it actually allowed him to uh, replace his legs. And, uh, yeah, anyway, he had his own series. Uh, I think it was just called Venom rather than Agent Venom. But, uh, yeah, it was, you can see here he's got a much more militaristic look. He's got these belts. Uh, he's got lots of guns and holsters, lots of little pouches. Um, it was just a really cool, unique look for Venom. Um, like these, there was parts of the costume that almost looked, I don't know, like a crustacean. He had these shoulder pads and on his, uh, forearms there these kind of weird shell like things and it was a short-lived look i always knew it would be the comic ran for i want to say maybe 30 issues or so so that's a pretty good run but this is the venom everybody knows anytime a character changes costumes drastically or a character dies or something like that you know it's never permanent so i knew we'd go back to classic venom eventually and, of course, we have. Um, Flash Thompson is currently dead in the comic books. He was killed. Um, so, yeah, Agent Venom seems like he's going to be off the table at least for a while. I don't know if we'll ever get him back. But, anyway, he's the kind of thing, knowing that it was a short-lived costume, that I didn't think we'd get a figure of that. Um, and so when this Walgreens exclusive Venom figure came out, I was super stoked. And I actually was not collecting Marvel Legends at this time. Um, as you'll see by the next figure on my list, I was all in on the three and three quarter inch line of uh, Marvel characters called Marvel Universe. So those were more in scale with G.I. Joes. Um, but then this figure came out and I was like, you know what? I bet they won't make this in the small scale. So I'll get it in the larger scale. And it's probably fair to say that this figure kicked off my collecting of Marvel Legends which in the last couple of years has probably become one of my largest um, collections. So yeah, it's partly because I thought this figure was so great. It's got a ton of detail, ton of articulation. Uh, it really like leaps off the page. This is what Agent Venom looked like. I'm just really glad we got him. Um, I, he came with a lot more accessories than what I'm showing here because he came with these uh, Venom-like tendrils that plugged into his back. So there was these four tentacles that came off. And he had at least four guns, and you could actually place the guns in the different tendrils, which was kind of a cool look. I just found they didn't stay in there very well. So this is how I've chosen to display him on my shelf. And actually, just recently, so this figure is from 2014, uh, just a couple of months ago, we got a new version of that figure, which is Agent Anti-Venom, which was an even shorter-lived look. I think he only had this look for maybe an issue or two. It might have only even been a couple of pages of a single issue now that I think about it. But anyway, it's kind of cool to get this variation and to revisit this figure because I still think it's great. And I definitely think this figure belongs on this list as the best of 2014. Number nine, Death's Head from the Marvel Universe line. So here's a closer look at Death's Head. So as I mentioned, this is from the three and three quarter inch line of Marvel figures called Marvel Universe, which were produced by Hasbro. And this was their primary line for, I don't know, a good five years or so. And I have a collection that's probably about a hundred or so figures, maybe even a little bit more than that. And it was, 
At first, the figures I thought were okay. A lot of them were pretty skinny, and they didn't have a ton of detail or accessories and whatnot. But it was around this time that things were really getting good. And Death's Head is such an obscure character. He actually has not been made as a 6-inch Marvel Legend to this day. They did make a Death's Head version 2 a little while ago. But this original version of Death's Head, which is the... Uh, he's like a bounty hunter from space who originally appeared in the Transformers comic book. Um, yeah, he's never been done in a 6-inch scale. And this figure is awesome. It's got a ton of detail. He's got lots of accessories. You see there he's got a mace, a shield and an axe and this uh the cape here is a separate piece so you could take that right off but he's got a lot of sculpted detail uh from like the ridges in his arms and his legs so the spikes all over him the belt and then he's got that great head design which maybe you can see here but with the kind of the underbite with those big spikes um yeah looks great i was a big big fan of this character he's one of those obscure marvel characters that I really liked. I collected his comic book back in the 90s, even though it was very short-lived. And yeah, I was just really stoked to get this figure. And it would still definitely make my list today, because not only is it a great figure, but it's the only one of this character that exists, as far as I know. So I'm really hoping that sometime in the near future, we get a figure similar to this in the 6-inch scale. At number 8, we've got Jabba the Hutt from the Star Wars Black series. So here's a closer look at Jabba. Now, I can definitely understand some people not understanding how he could make a best action figure list because he's not much of an action figure. He's a big, solid hunk of plastic here on the bottom. And then he's got this piece up here that moves. Uh, you can swivel him a little bit. You know what, actually, here you go. So he swivels a little bit at the, let's call it his waist. And then he's got some movement in the arms, so articulation at the elbows and his hands as well. Now this one here has got a cool feature, you're already seeing it in action there, but when you move his arms, it makes his mouth move. And because he's got this soft rubber, it, uh, it does a pretty good job of uh, imitating how he looked with the folds in his skin and stuff right in the movies. So yeah, it's a very cool feature. But, you know, he doesn't have much else, there's not any... Uh, accessories with this version there's very limited articulation so how does he make this list well basically i just love jab of the hut i always have here is my uh vintage jab of the hut figure that i had when i was a kid now you see he's quite a bit smaller because this one was in scale with the three and three quarter inch figures and you know i've got a couple other versions of uh of jabba that have come since but Getting him in the six inch scale for the first time. This is uh this was the first year, 2014, that I was really embracing not only Marvel Legends for the first time, but also the Star Wars Black series. They had launched a year or two before, and I was really reluctant to get in on the six inch Star Wars figures just because I had so many of the three and three quarter inch figures. Like even Jab of the Hut here, I've got three of them. I probably have twenty versions of Chewbacca and Darth Vader. So I really didn't want to get into buying those same characters again. But when they announced that this six inch Jabba was coming out, um, I couldn't resist it. And yeah, this is one of those figures that really got me on board with collecting the six inch scale uh, Star Wars Black Series. And that collection has grown substantially in the years since I got this figure. So yeah, he's not great as far as articulation and all that stuff goes, but I think the sculpting is great. The little action feature of the uh, the moving mouth is awesome. I think it's the best looking Jabba figure that we've ever gotten. They pretty much replicated exactly for this little version that came out around the same time, but bigger is better. So there you go. This Jabba is still awesome and it still deserves a spot on the best of 2014. In number seven, we've got this third party version of the Transformer Swerve. So here's a closer look at Swerve. So this is not an officially licensed version of the character, which would have come from Hasbro or Takara. Instead, this is one of those third-party Transformers, which there are a lot of them out there, which basically means these companies make action figures of these popular Transformers characters, but they don't have any like legal right to do so. I don't know how they keep getting away with it, to be honest with you, but uh, 
There's lots of them out there, and most of the time they're better than what Hasbro gives us officially. So this here is supposed to be the character of Swerve. Anybody can tell that by looking at him. But technically, the packaging called him Trash Talk. And just to give you a little bit of background on this character, my favorite Transform when I was a kid was this guy, Gears. Now, this, so this is the original one from the 80s. And they repainted him uh, yellow, or sorry, uh, repainted him white and red. Um, and they gave him a different face. And they called him Swerve. I never had Swerve as a kid because I just basically viewed him as kind of a knockoff of my already favorite character, Gears. But in the comic books that IDW does, they've gone a long way in really giving Swerve a personality and making him a unique character. For one, he's very talkative, which is partly why um, Make Toys, that made this figure, decided to call him Trash Talk. So that's a kind of nod to his his talkative self in IDW's comic books. And even just the sculpting itself. I'm having a hard time getting it to show up here on screen, but you see that like kind of laughing smile that he has? Um, that's very true to how he looks in the comic books. Anyway, so I would probably say nowadays, just based on how he's portrayed in the comic books, I might even like Swerve more than I like Gears. They're pretty neck and neck. Anyway, every time they remake a new version of Gears, they make a new version of Swerve as well. So, for example, um, Hasbro made a new version of Gears and Swerve uh, maybe a year or so after this. So here's the two of them, and you see the figures are basically the same. They just kind of change their head and their color scheme. For this version of uh, Swerve, the Trash Talk version, here's Make Toys version of Gears, which came out the same year. I got them at the same time. He probably could have made the list as well because he's a great figure in his own right. And actually, the year before, in 2013, I bought these versions from a third-party company called iGear. So this is their version of Gears, which was very high up on my list for 2013. And here's their version of Swerve. And Swerve actually made my best of list that year as well. Now this is one of those instances where in hindsight, if I was to remake my 2013 list, I would not have put this version of Swerve, whose name was Veer, on my list. Because at the time, I thought it was the best version of this character I was going to get, but the colors were kind of muted, he's kind of stiff, the sculpt doesn't have a whole lot of personality in it. I didn't know that a mere year later, I would get this much more fun and dynamic version of the character. So yeah, this guy, still a good figure, but definitely not the best version of Swerve you can get. This one, I think, is. I don't think you could do much better than what uh, Make Toys gave us here in 2014. So, would he still make the list? Absolutely. I still love this figure. I love this character. And yeah, I think he's great. At number six, we've got the Star Wars Black Series Standard Stormtrooper. So here's a closer look at the Stormtrooper. And what more can you really say about this guy? He does look great. Everybody's familiar with the Stormtrooper look. And this figure captures it really well. I think proportion-wise, it all works really well. It all looks really good. And I've always loved the Stormtrooper costume. And even though I have dozens of these guys in the 3 and 3 quarter inch scale... This was my first time getting one in the 6-inch scale, and I just thought it looked really sharp in this uh, larger scale. Um, the really crisp white, I like uh, for accessories. He's got this pistol. He might have also come with a rifle. I don't recall at this point. Um, he's got a little holster on the back here that holds his, uh, his pistol. And yeah, it's a great-looking figure. Um, I don't think you could make a better 6-inch Stormtrooper. However... I don't think this figure would make the list if I were to revisit this. Partly because, you can sort of see them a little bit in the background there, I have a lot of Stormtroopers now, different variations of them. Even this figure here, I have this one almost identical a few times because I have a version of Luke and Han in their Stormtrooper costumes which look identical to this except the helmet is removable and it has Luke and Han's head underneath. I also have a couple of Sand Troopers 
which is just this exact figure except with kind of a colored shoulder pad. Um, I've got a battle damaged version of this Stormtrooper. Like the Stormtrooper is a design I've been very familiar with basically my whole life and it's just maybe been kind of done to death. Even the new version of the Stormtrooper from the, uh, the newer trilogy, I have a couple of variations of that now. So at the time, this was my first six inch Stormtrooper and I was just kind of excited about it. Um, I think I'd probably get it near the end of the year around the time I was making the list. And yeah, he is a sharp looking figure. But at the same time, when I think of all the great toys I got that year, I think uh, now that uh, I've had time to let it settle in, I'm not as excited about this Stormtrooper as I normally would be. But don't get me wrong, still a great figure. Number five, we've got Catwoman, the Greg Capullo designer series figure. So here's a closer look at Catwoman. So as I mentioned, this is from uh, the designer series by DC Direct, in which case they base the figures off of, of a particular artist's uh, style. So this one here is based off Greg Capullo, who uh, I know mostly from his many, many years of drawing Spawn. Um, but he then later later came to like much more prominence when he took on the role of uh, the artist for Batman, along with Scott Snyder as the writer. So that was a pretty high-profile gig. And uh, yeah, his designs of all the characters were really nice. And I think this is a really nice Catwoman figure. This is the, the Catwoman... Or, like, this is the look I most associate with Catwoman. Like, um, you know, she used to have, you know, long hair coming out the back of her cowl. She wore, like, a skirt. She had a purple outfit. She's had lots of different looks. But um, kind of the uh, Michelle Pfeiffer look from the movie is the look I like best. And then kind of the look that she took on in the comic books um, shortly afterwards, which is basically this full-body black leather cat suit with the cat ears, the whip. This is the look that I like best. And this is a really nice figure as far as the sculpting goes. Very nicely proportioned, good pose, good accessory. She's got her whip there. Um, the nice paint job, even though it's pretty minimal paint, but she's got those bright red lips that really pop and the gold, almost reflective uh, paint on her goggles there. It's really nice. Where this figure kind of falls short is on the articulation. DC Direct had never been great when it comes to their articulation. Like here, she's got ball jointed shoulders. She bends at the elbows, but her legs, you see she can kick forward and back like that, but there's no uh, split. And for a character that's as agile as Catwoman, I feel that's kind of a pretty big strike against that she's pretty much stuck in this position. So a good figure, I still like it, but would it still make my list now? Probably not. Partly because I don't buy a ton of DC figures, but a couple of years ago, back in the, you know, around 2010, 2013, 2014, I was buying quite a few more. And I think it was just a year after this, maybe only a couple of months after this, that I got another DC Direct Designer Series figure, which is this Catwoman based on Darwin Cook's art. Now, Darwin Cook, his look is a lot more stylized. It maybe doesn't work as like the most you know iconic generic version of a Catwoman. If you're only going to have one Catwoman, you might not want one this stylized. But I'm a huge Darwin Cook fan. I really like this figure. You can see the costume is the same. It's still got the zipper up the front. Um, where this one differs is the goggles are pushed up, so you can really see um, the details of her face. She's got the belt buckle there. Otherwise, they're pretty similar. This one suffers from the same articulation issues. You can see there, she can only move her legs forward and backward, not out to the side. But if I knew that I was going to get this figure just a couple of months after this one, I do prefer this one here. And so that would knock this one down a few pegs right there. So both are good. There's still room for improvement. But uh, yeah, both of them are decent. At number four, we've got Supergirl based on her new 52 look. So here's a closer look at Supergirl. And this is specifically based on her look from the new 52 universe. Now, if you're not familiar with Supergirl or the new 52, here's a very quick recap. 
she was a character that was featured prominently in Superman comic books uh, for several years, decades, maybe. Um, she's Superman's cousin. But anyway, in the 80s, DC decided there was just too many variations of Superman floating around and it made him less special. So they killed Supergirl off in a comic book called Crisis on Infinite Earths. And Supergirl was gone for a really long time. And then, uh, I guess it was probably the early 2000s, she was resurrected in a storyline written by Jeff Loeb. Um, and that's kind of when I got on board with Supergirl again. I was glad to see that she was back. But her initial appearances, she looked, uh, I don't know, kind of... Uh, she was just a little much. She was a little too 90s looking, art style and everything. Um, I wasn't really feeling it. And then when DC rebooted their universe again, they called it the New 52 because they were launching with 52 new titles. And uh, so they rebooted Supergirl again with a new origin story and a new look. And this was her look. And while it's not very practical, like most female superhero costumes, I like it. Um, like, I don't understand these boots that have your knees showing. That seems to be probably one of the main reasons you would want to wear boots is to have your knees covered. But she doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. But I like the way it looked, at least in the comic books. And they translated it pretty well to the figure here. I like this paint, this kind of metallic red that's used on the boots and elsewhere in the costume. This kind of short cape with the yellow trim looks really nice. Um, and most of all, I love this face sculpt. Like, it's a very pretty face sculpt. Um, the eyes are very piercing with those bright blues. It's just a really nice looking figure, and it really represented the new 52 Supergirl quite well. I still think this figure holds up. Now, like Catwoman, I have got other Supergirl figures since. I also got the Darwin Cook Supergirl. And even though I really like this Supergirl costume, this is definitely a stylized look. And it looks like a Supergirl of the 1930s or 40s or something. This I definitely wouldn't want as my only Supergirl. It's just too specific looking for a particular era. And then I also got this Supergirl figure which I feel this would be a good Supergirl figure if you're only going to have one in your collection. It's kind of a, the best of all worlds. So she's got the, the big long boots. Of course, she doesn't have the knees cut out. She's got the red skirt, which most people associate with Supergirl. She's got the long hair, the red cape, everything you'd expect to see in Supergirl. This is kind of the iconic Supergirl look. But I happen to like this one. So even though I've got these two versions, both of which I like, this is still my favorite of all the Supergirls in my collection. So yes, she would still make my list. I still think it's a really great figure. Number three, the Toxo Viper version three from the G.I. Joe Collectors Club. So here's a closer look at the Toxo Viper. All three of them, actually. So this figure here came in one of the G.I. Joe Collectors Club convention box sets, which every year at the G.I. Joe convention, the Collectors Club would put out a set of 15 figures, and it usually contained one or two uh, troopers like this, so kind of a generic soldier. And because they know people would want little squads of these little soldiers, they would usually put them in groups of three, uh, sometimes more. So in this particular set, we got three of the Toxo Viper version three, and if you're a zombie fan, we also got three versions of this guy, which is a Toxo Viper that has been zombified. So his armor is kind of breaking apart, um, which is also kind of cool. But I like this one. And to my surprise, it's kind of surprising to me how much I like this figure. Because the first version of the Toxo Viper uh, that came out in, uh, what was it, I don't know, 86, 87? That's the one I had and that I grew up with. And I really liked that version. It had kind of a weird duck build looking gas mask on it. And then... In the 90s, they made a version 2, which looked like this. So when the modern era of G.I. Joe started, I was hoping they would remake the Toxo Viper I grew up with. When I found out they were making this box set that was focused on like a biohazard, I thought, okay, great, I'm going to get a new version of the Toxo Viper finally. But I was disappointed to find that they were going to redo Toxo Viper version 2 from the 90s rather than the 80s version. However, when I got these guys in hand... I fell in love with them. I think they look awesome. I love the color palette of the purple and the green with the red highlights. 
Um, the body is made of all reused parts that we had seen previously, but this head sculpt is brand new and it is a killer head sculpt. It just looks really great. These make for really interesting looking troopers and I'm glad that we got three of them. So I've got a nice looking little squad of these guys and yeah, I still think they hold up. I think this is one of the best figures that the G.I. Joe's Collectors Club put out and they put out a lot of them. So this guy would still rank very highly on my list if I were to put it together today. In the number two spot, we've got the Gobot Psykill. This third party version is called Salmore. So here's a better look at Psykill, or as I suppose I should call him, Salmore. So here you get a good look at his face, which is one of the things I really love about this figure, is the great uh, head sculpt there. Uh, I also love all the, uh, the metal pieces um, there's some of this, this is actually uh, plastic here, but it's just uh, kind of vac metal chrome. So it looks metallic, like a lot of the vintage GoBots head, uh, a lot of actual metal parts and stuff. You don't really see that nowadays, but it looks really great. And so one of the reasons I really like this figure is I really liked some of the GoBot designs and GoBots were kind of the uh, lesser transforming toy line that was produced by Tonka in the 80s and Psykill here was the leader of the bad guys so he was essentially the Megatron of the GoBots and I have the original figure he's a little worse for wear but here's Psykill of the 80s you see one of his arms is busted off here but his face is very unassuming and he transforms into a little motorcycle and this is essentially what it looked like you put a tire there that connected to the other arm and there was a tire that went between his legs and that was essentially him in motorcycle mode. GoBots were relatively easy to transform. And I loved these little figures. I liked that they were easy to transform. I liked the metal parts or the metal looking parts at least. And uh, yeah, I still think this guy holds up as a cool figure. I wish he wasn't all busted up. But when this figure came out, I was really glad to see Psykill get his due. Because this guy looks menacing. This guy looks like he could take on Megatron. He's just got so much more detail, so much more articulation. Uh, he's over six, he's about six, maybe six to seven inches tall. So definitely larger than the, the original one, which only comes up to about his knee. Uh, and he's got some embellishments here. Like he still has the, the rubber, rubber sole tires. Um, but now he's got these kind of gladiator shield spikes that go over them and those are removable so you can take those off if you like. Um, and just overall throughout the body, just a lot more detailed. These, uh, these things here, uh, that work as his guns. I don't know anything about motorcycles, but these are like also the, uh, you know, the gas tanks or whatever when he's in bike mode and they convert to his guns, which is really cool. I like the way he's got a little bit of, uh, asymmetrical look to him the fact that the fact that his legs don't match up i actually really like uh, i just i love this figure and i've talked about it before because i actually posted a video a while back where i did the top 10 toys in my collection and that was not an easy list to do because that was me ranking um 10 figures out of the thousands that i own and the fact that this guy was in my top 10 this was, I think, the only transforming toy I had in my collection. Speaks to how much I like this figure. Not only is it just really cool looking, but I also looked at it by how much of an improvement it was over the original toy I had in the 80s. Um, and yeah, everything that I said about it in that video still holds up now. I think he's a great looking figure. Um, there have been some other redos of this character, and they're all pretty nice, actually. Um, but this one I still think is the best of the bunch. And I highly recommend you seek it out. So this is Psykill slash Sal Moore at the number two spot. And I think he belongs there. And in the number one spot, we've got The Crow from Hot Toys. So here's a closer look at The Crow. This is a 12-inch figure produced by Hot Toys. And like Psykill, this guy also made my top 10 figures of my entire collection list. Um, and the reason should be obvious. This figure is incredible. 
if you own any hot toys um, you would understand how they could very easily make your top 10 list because they are just made with such detail and such care like there's strings on his uh, guitar here and just all the different textures he's got his little uh, little engagement ring there around his his neck um, I'm going to shut off the light here because it's flushing out a lot of the details. So yeah, you'll see here, there's just a ton of detail in the face sculpt. So this is uh, based on the actor Brandon Lee who played the crow in the movie. And yeah, I think the face sculpt is great. And I really don't think it's picking it up very well in this video here, but even just the different textures used because his face is white but you can kind of see like the pores of his skin in the makeup his eyes are painted with a gloss so they look wet and then his teeth are again a different shade of white there it all just looks great you got the tears in his leather jacket comes with the display base comes with the guitar um, i think he came with a bunch of alternate hands he also came with his crow like the actual bird sidekick that has its own display stand so it looks like it's flying along beside him um, it's just a fantastic figure and i won't talk about it for too long because i did talk about it at length in my best toys in my collection video that i posted just not too long ago so uh yeah 2014 i think was a pretty good year considering that the top two figures i named this year ended up on my best of all time list so there you go there's the crow from hot toys so there you go. That's my top 14 of 2014. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to like the video below. Um, please leave any comments. Do you agree with my list? Disagree? Have a list of your own you want to share? Um, I appreciate all the comments. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you next week with perhaps another similar video. Uh, and if not, I'll see you sometime around the holidays. So as always, thanks for watching and I will see you next time.